meeting to order. In accordance with the Open Public Meetings Act, PL 1975, <coughs> Chapter 231, adequate notice of this regular meeting of the Board of Adjustment of the Township of Franklin has been provided. Board members, applicant, professionals, and members of the public, please speak directly into microphones so that our recording secretary can properly process minutes. Applicants and professionals, please fill out the sheet on the table when you've completed your testimony. Thank you. And uh, we have no announcements uh, of things to be carried, so we can begin right away with roll call. Actually, we do have an announcement. Um, that's why I put the final memo in front of, front of you. Uh, Mohammed Ryman and Samina Habib, docket number ZBA 22-00005. That matter is being carried to August 4th here at the uh, board at the uh, board meeting at 7.30 p.m. Okay, I didn't consider that one because I know that if it all worked out should only be about a minute. Yeah, uh, but they're going to come back on August 4th. Okay. Okay. Then we can move to the roll call. Yes, sir. Uh, Cheryl Bethia, Alan Rich, <coughs> excuse me, and Robert Shepard all asked to be excused this evening. Uh, Rich Prokanik? Here. Joel Reese? Here. Gary Rosenthal? Here. Vasim Verdas? Here. Elizabeth Clarkin? Uh, Faraz Khan? Here. And Chairman Thomas? Here. Okay. Minutes of the regular meeting, May 5th, 2022. Is there a motion? I'll move. Second. Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Vasim Verdas? And Chairman Thomas? Yes. Resolutions, Ricardo Perez, CBA 22-0004. We need a motion. I'll move. Second. Um, Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Vasim Verdas? Chairman Thomas? Yes. Sarwat Siddiqui? ZBA 220007. I'll move. Just say it in the. Sorry, she has to hear you, so. Yeah. Second. Mm -hmm. Richard Prokranik? Yes. Joel Reese? Yes. Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Chairman Thomas? Yes. Arthur and Diane Wilmot, ZBA 220003. I'll move. Second. Richard Buchanan? Yes. The same Verdas? Yes. Oh, Gary, you can't first it. You can't vote. Okay. You need another motion? I'll first. Okay, so we'll put Richard first and Basim second. Okay? Uh, Richard Prokhanik said yes. Basim Verdas said yes. And Chairman Thomas? Yes. Okay. Okay, we can move uh, on down to the first schedule hearing. We already dealt with the first one. Uh, St. Charbel, Marionite Church, CBA 20-00027. D3 conditional use variances, preliminary final site plan with C variance in which the applicant proposes demolishing the existing church and daycare use as well as four of the single family homes on the site and constructing a new 35,699 square foot place of worship at 526 Easton Avenue, Somerset, Block 261, Lots 1 through 6 in the, the office professional and R7 zone. Uh, I see Mr. Smith ready to go, so we will proceed. Okay, Mr. Chairman, for the record, my name is Bob Smith. I'm a licensed attorney in the state of New Jersey, and I'm here tonight representing St. Charbel Marionite Church, uh, all of which is known to every member of the board. You probably don't pass it every day, but probably at least once a week uh, on Easton Avenue. Uh, been here for a long, long time providing religious services to Franklin residents and other residents. And I, if, with your permission, because I can't help myself, whenever I represent a religious institution, Orthodox Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, I start with the same line. We manage to get an approval every time, so 
it's like bad luck if I don't say it. So let me say it. I'm here tonight representing God. If you deny our application, your immortal soul is in peril. And that usually kind of puts everything in perspective. Um, we're here tonight seeking preliminary and final site plan approval, uh, conditional use variances, uh, perhaps a D6 variance for height, some bulk variances. Uh, we are demolishing the existing church and four of the dwelling units on the site. We're keeping up the parish house. Uh, and we're going to end up with a 96 parking spaces. And right now there's about one third of that. And also, we, for whatever reason, this number, it's like a number that just won't go away. We're not building a 35,000 square foot church. We're building a 21,000... 400 plus or minus church, all right? So just to, to um, put that in perspective, this property is in the OP and R7 zone, so it's a split zone lot. And uh, the point of the application, New St. Charbel for, uh, for modern times. Uh, it's my intention to call uh, several witnesses. I have to my, seated to my left, Father Simon, who is the pastor of St. Charbel. I have to my right Mr. Remo, his, who is our licensed professional engineer. Uh, we have a traffic expert uh, who may be known to the town, Lee Klein. We have our architect, Mike Campbell. And we also have our planner, Beth McManus, and all with different functions, as you know. So with your permission, I'd like to ask that Father Simon be called and sworn so that he can testify. Father Simon. Father Simon, if you just raise your right hand. Do you swear that testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Father Simon, if you would, for the record, by whom are you employed and in what capacity? I'm a pastor of St. Shavuot Church. Uh, that's part of the Parque of St. Marin of Brooklyn. And uh, we are here for the uh, uh, new project, new church. Okay. And how long have you been the pastor at this church? I'm, I've been here for four years. Okay, and um, if you know, how long has the church been there? It's been over uh, over 35 years, since 1980. Okay, terrific. And why do we need a new church? So there are three reasons. First, um, if you go into the building, you see it's uh, we've been patching it here and there. Um, it's deteriorating need to be fixed up, so the better way is just to demolish and build new. Second reason is we need to serve our elders and handicap. If you go to the building, you have a hall, but then you have to go steps down to the church. And for the elders and handicap, it's really hard. And more than that, um, we cannot have an elevator or anything else that help in this situation. So we need to have a church and a hall that's all on the same level. So our people can go in and out, and it's up to code. And the third reason is we need to have a bigger parking lot. Uh, many of our parishioners park on the streets, so we need to take this traffic out from the street into the parking lot. So this way we have a better uh, looking from the outside and inside, a better serving our community, and at the same time, less traffic on the street, and put them all in the parking. And if you would, would you describe for the board what activities will occur at the church um, during a weekly schedule? So um, first, uh, I want to say um, we have our parishioners, friends, and neighbors of St. Shavuot who are here to support us. Uh, this is not a room full of objectors, no, no, to your knowledge? No, no. Okay. Good. You can raise your hands. <laughs> See? Okay. Thank you. So you know who they are. Um, so uh, as a church, you know, we're an Eastern Catholic church uh, based in the Middle East. Uh, all these parishioners who uh, migrated back in the 1970s, 80s, even before, uh, coming together, having the uh, uh, spiritual life and the social life, coming together um, uh, with their children, learning about their heritage and their faith. So the building, we have um, a home, a church, and classes for our kids. 
the church is used for our worship, the hall is used for our social activities and coming together as fair one family, and the classes are used for the, our children to learn more about their heritage and their faith. So this is the building, the complex we need, and of course a big parking lot to park. So coming together as a community, living their faith uh, in this beautiful township, um, our parishioners are all your as citizens and they're trying hard to be part of the society community. We have engineers, teachers, professors, policemen, government agents. They're all contributing to this great country. And as usual, they all came here for the big dream and now they're part of this um, diverse culture uh, country. Okay. How many seats are we planning in the church? Um, 275 to right. 286. So, so I'm sure the board would ask the question, of course. are you anticipating any major new growth in the church's size in terms of number of parishioners? The church is an ethnic church. So as I said, they're from the Middle East, majority are Lebanese. So this is the community coming together here. So it's not the church that's, it's of course it's open to everyone, but because of our ethnic uh, ethnicity, having the mass in English and in Arabic language, it's really hard for people from the outside to, to join. So it's more as our community. And the only thing we're building because it's really in a bad condition, that's all. Thank you very much, Father. Uh, Father Simon's open for questions. Any, any board questions? In your, in your operations, uh, I'm assuming you're, you're going to have multiple masses. Usually we have on Saturday mass at 5 p.m. and Sunday mass 11 a.m. and that's it. Okay, and then uh, you're going to continue the daycare? No. No? No. Okay. We just already <sighs> talked to them, finalized the process. Um, they'll be leaving whenever their new location is ready. And I think it's held because, because they're doing some work with the Somerset also. They're not done yet. And then how, how many, uh, your, your services are going to be Sundays, or there, is there a Saturday one? Saturday, or? 5 p.m., one mass, and Sunday, 11 a.m., that's it. And then during the week, other There's nothing. So small we usually have a weekday mass at 10 a.m. We do it, um, and that's what we do every day. What we're eliminating is the daycare, so there's no traffic, no people coming, you know, this is less... And I'm just reviewing this for the, mm -hmm. the record. I, I know you, I've been to f funerals there, so I'm assuming you're continuing funerals and weddings, normal activities associated with... Yeah, that's part, part of the church life, yes. Okay. Besides the masses, Father, um, what about the kitchen facilities? The kitchen, uh, we already have a kitchen now, so we're just trying to make sure it's up to code and that we use it when we have our social activity, like usually on the weekends. That's it. Uh, for, for, Father, how, how, many, how, how many members do you have? Uh, we have around 496 families and, total. And, and how many come to each service usually? So we have around 300 people total that show up, you know, on uh, Saturday and Sunday. So they're split, so it's not all one mess. 300 total for Saturday and Sunday, not, well, yeah, not 300 time. Saturday, no. 300 Sunday. Okay. You know, uh, usually uh, these days, we don't, you never have 100% uh, people show, right? So the, now, according to the statistics, around 20%, 30%, unless you have a big feast like Christmas, Easter, that's where the bigger numbers show up. I assume you're going to continue the <coughs> festival in the spring? Yes, this is uh, one of the major, uh, you know, uh, funds for the church, yes. Any other questions? Mr. Chairman, I think it may help. Um, in my report, on, starting on page three, I have a, 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 about eight kind of our standard questions that we pretty much ask every place of worship. So, Mr. Smith, could you just maybe go down those questions and 
I, I think some of them, again, are in the record in the, to the effect that I put the, your responses in my report, but it may help, I think, for the public um, and for the board to hear their And hear just double-checking, that's the April 11th, 2022 memo? Yes. Okay. And it'd be, it'd be, it's the first comment starting on uh, page 3, A through G. If you could just run through sure. those, because again, these are kind of the standard questions we ask every place of worship. Absolutely. So, 1A, does the existing church contain a fellowship hall? The answer, of course, yes. is yes. If so, what is the current square footage? I'll ask the architect. <laughs> uh, we have Mr. Campbell here who can give you this, the current square footage. And such clarification is important as it may help the board consider the relative increases in traffic generation and required parking. So um, th that question was asked, and the applicant's response was to cite the square footage of the fellowship hall in the proposed building, not whether there was a fellowship hall in the existing. So the answer tonight is you do have a fellowship hall okay. in and the existing building. And we'll wait to hear from the architect, I guess, on that. On the square footage. Yeah, that'll be okay. fine. All right, 1B, the applicant should address the intended use of the fellowship hall and the timing of such use. For example, would it be used while the sanctuary is in use during services, either for overflow or other purposes? And you point out that the response that we gave you was the fellowship hall is for activities used by parishioners after the divine liturgy at the mass, people gather to have lunch on Sundays or coffee hour. It is the time of social recreation. So um, I guess the question that you're asking is, would you have church services there as overflow? Is that uh, the yeah, question? Yes, that's the follow-up question. So is there any overflow of parishioners sitting in the fellowship hall while the mass is being said? That's only we see it on Good Friday. Good but Friday, now, once a year. But now with the, with the church capacity, I don't think we'll need it anymore. The because new church, the church will have more be, seats? Yes. Okay. So you don't see any overflow. That You're not see, uh, foreseeing that. Um, item 1C. Beyond the depiction on the floor plans, the application makes no mention of the 10 proposed classrooms or their intended use. The applicant needs to explain the use of the 10 cl uh, classrooms may affect the calculation of required parking. And we previously responded the 10 classrooms are for our children who arrive on Saturdays from 1.30 to 4.45 p.m. to learn their native language, Arabic, followed with a break, 30-minute snack, then religious education. The children and their families attend the Mass at 5 p.m. The gathering is once a week. Uh, if the classrooms are limited to the use as described above, then it would be my determination that the classrooms are necessary, are accessory, rather, to the place of worship use and do not generate additional parking requirements under the township ordinance. So I think what uh, Mr. Healy is asking for is your uh, uh, a great uh, acknowledgement that the children's use is in conjunction with the 5 o'clock Mass. They're there early to learn something, and then they go to Mass. Is that true? Correct. The answer to the question? Yep. Thank you. Okay. 1D, would the new place of worship contain a daycare, or would that operation cease at the site? And you've already answered it's ceasing, correct? Yes. And you say in here, applicant's response will be no daycare in the future. The lease will end by July 1st, 2022. We're not leasing the place anymore. They have already found another location to move to. So I think that answers that question. 1E, the applicant should explain whether any special holiday events would be anticipated at the site and the nature dates, expected building occupancy, as well as traffic generation and parking needs associated with any such events. Applicant's response, as the traffic engineer noticed in his report, the only big event we have is in the second week of June. It's the festival. Every year the festival is a way to recall our heritage. Also, it is a source of income for the church. And I believe that answers the question. I believe so. Okay. And then 1F, the applicant should explain whether any part of the facility would be rented out. Applicant's response, none of the facility will be rented out. 
It is exclusively for the use of the parish and parishioners. Correct. I think that answers the question pretty thoroughly. And finally, 1G, what is the intended use of the existing dwelling at the corner of Franklin Boulevard and Blake Avenue that is proposed to be retained? Applicant's response, 10 Franklin Boulevard is the church house where the priest resides. And that would be you, correct? Correct. Okay, so correct. it's the parish home for the pastor. Thank you. I think we answered them all, right? You did, thank you. All right. Uh, just one comment in addition to that. Uh, we have a number of religious institutions that have special events and have to work. Is there any reason that this one needs to be required to work with the town in terms of traffic control or any other measures like we have with several other institutions? Well, if I recall correctly, they um, they submit for a special event permit. So they already are. Yeah, they already are. Okay. Any uh, other questions or anything? We would normally, uh, well, well, we'll do this. We're all open to the public, and if anyone has any questions for this witness concerning his testimony, this would be the time to do it. This is not a time to make a statement uh, or anything like that, but just to ask questions or clarify, to help us clarify information. Okay, don't see any next. Uh, okay, just a moment. Yes, come on up to the mic. We need your name and address. My name is Christy Lau. I live on uh, 238 Blake Avenue, so just down the road from the church. Uh, C H R I S T I E, last name is L O W. <clears throat> so every year um, the church has the festival, and every year there's a lot of parking, right? And so we have um, typically applied to the police to actually have one side of the road um, closed off uh, just because when it's parked on both sides. It is really hard to access our houses. Um, my question is, um, is the church anticipating to actually have the festival indoors, um, or is it, will it still be outdoors and therefore within the parking lot and, you know, continuing with the kind of the traffic situation that we have every year during the three-day um, festival period? So uh, since we have a big hole now to use, many of these people will be sitting <coughs> inside and we'll have uh, only a partial part of the uh, parking lot will have the festival outside. But that's why we have the bigger parking lot where all these cars can park in. So we have less cars on the streets. So by, by maintaining from 39 to 96, so this way we have cars in the parking. We're not using for the festival, just part of it that's closer to the building. So, so let me just follow up. Would it be fair to say, in your view, this is going to be a much better situation oh, yeah, for the course. surrounding neighborhood? Of course. And as a matter of fact, we have no objection if the neighbors ask for the police to have one side no parking on. But they're already doing it, and uh, we're happy. But we have no problem with it going on in the future, too. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Then we'll close again to the public and Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my next witness is Mr. Mark Remo, seated, seated to my right. Uh, Mr. Remo is our engineer. I'd ask him to be sworn so that he can give testimony. Mr. Remo, please raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Remo, for the record, by whom are you employed and in what capacity? Uh, I'm employed with uh, Remo Engineering. I'm also a uh, licensed professional engineer in New Jersey, New York, several other states, and Washington, D.C. I'm also a licensed professional planner in New Jersey and a certified municipal engineer. I have uh, over 37 years' experience in uh, all aspects of site plan and subdivision design. We'll, we'll accept your credentials. Okay. and You're testifying presently as, now as what the engineer? Professional engineer. Okay. engineer as an engineer. We have another planner, actually. So if you would, Mr. Remo, um, 
we'd appreciate it very much if you describe the existing area. And then secondly, what is it that we're proposing in the new St. Charbel? Sure. So the, uh, the existing site, the property is, uh, that's being developed is known as lots 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 in block 261. Essentially, the whole block is 261. Also, it's also known as 526 Easton Avenue. Uh, the site is located uh, at the uh, northwest corner of the intersection of Franklin Boulevard and Easton Avenue. The site also has frontages on Reeve Street and Blake Avenue. The property is rectangular in shape, and the uh, lot width uh, is about 204 feet along uh, Easton Avenue, 385 feet uh, along Franklin Boulevard, 345 feet uh, along Reeve Street, and approximately 199 feet along Blake Avenue. The uh, total area of all the lots uh, encompassing the site is uh, 72,527 square feet, or 1.66 acres. Currently, the site is developed and contains a one-story brick church building and an associated asphalt paved parking lot. Uh, containing 36 parking spaces. The site also contains five uh, single-family dwellings and associated driveways. The uh, existing dwelling on Lot 2 was recently uh, demolished, so there's actually four out there now. Uh, the remainder of the site is predominantly grass and some scattered trees. The uh, topography of the site moderately slopes generally in an easterly direction towards the intersection of Easton Avenue and Franklin Boulevard. The uh, site is located in the OP uh, Office Professional and the R7 Residential Zone Districts. Lot 1, which is the lot that contains the existing church, is actually located in the OP Zone. And the uh, existing houses are actually in the R7 Zone. Uses surrounding the site are office buildings to the east and west along uh, Eastern Avenue. Um, also, there are single-family dwellings uh, along Easton Avenue, Franklin Boulevard, Blake Street, and also Reeve Street. The, uh, the applicant for the project proposes to consolidate uh, all of the lots and demolish uh, four of the dwellings and the existing church building and construct a church building and an asphalt paved parking lot to serve the development. A total of 96 parking spaces is proposed. The church building will have a floor area of approximately 20,240 square feet and contain 275 seats. The, uh, the uh, proposed building will be set back 13.54 feet from Easton Avenue right away, 19.17 feet from the Franklin Boulevard right away, 21.50 feet from the Reeve Street right away, and uh, 249 feet from uh, the Blake Street. Uh, right away. And those proposed dimensions are actually, um, the county had requested some right away dedication uh, along Easton Avenue and also on Franklin Boulevard. On Easton Avenue, they asked for five feet dedication. Franklin Boulevard was uh, eight feet dedication. So it actually uh, lessened the uh, setback distances. Uh, as far as access, um, there, the um, <coughs> Again, the, the property will contain 96 parking spaces, and that includes four handicapped spaces. The dimensions of the stalls are 19 by 18 feet, and the driveway widths are, uh, and aisles are 24 feet wide. Access and egress will be from uh, Franklin Boulevard, Reeve Street, Blake Street, uh, by a 24-foot wide two-directional driveway. Left turn and egress uh, will be restricted at the uh, Franklin Boulevard driveway. That was a request from the uh, county. All right, and just FYI, we did a pre-application meeting with the Somerset County Planning Board at the suggestion of uh, Franklin staff, which was a great idea, because they pointed out what they would be requiring on their streets. And uh, we believe we're in conformance with what they want. So it was a great idea to go ahead, and we're not going to have a left, as I understand it, if you're coming down Franklin Boulevard, you're not going to be able to make a left into the site, which currently oh, you can it's do. A left, left out, actually. I'm sorry, a left out. Yeah, you can't, you can't make a left out of the Franklin Boulevard. Thank right. you. All right, and I interrupted you. Sure. Um, so as far as drainage, uh, we're proposing uh, drainage improvements uh, for the project, and that includes the construction of a subsurface detention facility, and that's located beneath the parking lot. 
and also the construction of a storm sewer system to collect all the surface runoff and direct it to the uh, detention facility. The uh, detention facility will have a capacity of 13,357 cubic feet. It will consist of 30 feet by 153 feet by three foot deep Brentwood storm water uh, storage modules. The uh, outflow structure will control the runoff from the site to the pre-development rates, actually to less than the pre-development rates. The outflow pipe uh, from the facility will connect to a proposed inlet on uh, Franklin Boulevard. Uh, surface runoff from the site will be directed and controlled and water quality will be provided for all the runoff. Uh, and so since we're providing detention, there should be no detrimental impacts on the downstream uh, areas. As far as utilities, uh, the development will be served by existing gas, water, electric on uh, Franklin Boulevard and sanitary sewer facilities located on uh, Easton Avenue. These utilities will be extended into the site. With regard to lighting, uh, the proposed parking lot lighting will consist of 15 foot high pole mounted luminaires uh, located in the parking lot. These are kind of a down lights, shoebox style down lights, so they won't be uh, uh, directed outward towards adjacent roadways and properties and also be screened appropriately. Uh, with regard to landscaping, uh, we're proposing uh, shade trees along uh, Easton Avenue, Franklin Boulevard, Reeve Street, and Blake Avenue. Flowering type trees will be planted uh, at all the uh, curbed islands throughout the site. And uh, various types of uh, shrubs will be planted along the building foundation and along the parking lot perimeter. Evergreen screening type trees will be planted around the trash enclosure to uh, screen the parking lot from the adjacent property uh, properties and uh, also to screen the trash from view from just people driving by on Franklin Boulevard. All the other areas that will be disturbed will be uh, grassed. Uh, as far as variances go, uh, a conditional use variance is required. Houses of worship are permitted in the uh, OP and the R7 zone provided they meet certain criteria. Uh, minimum lot setback required is 50 feet, so we need a variance for that where 13.54 uh, feet is proposed on Easton Avenue, 19.17 is proposed on Franklin Boulevard, and 21.5 feet is proposed on Reeve Street. Minimum driveway width required is 26 feet where we're providing 24 feet. Minimum landscape buffer required is 15 feet or 25 feet uh, where we're providing uh, 5 feet. Maximum building coverage required is 20% where 20.5% is proposed. Maximum impervious coverage is uh, required is 60% in the R7 zone and 45% in the OP zone and we're proposing 72.2%. Maximum building height required is 35 feet where 39.2 feet is proposed and the minimum parking spaces required is 360 spaces where 96 spaces are proposed. Uh, as far as uh, outside agency approvals, the soil erosion and sediment control plan has been prepared and submitted to the uh, Somerset Union Soil Conservation District. We have reviewed, uh, we have uh, actually received some comments, so we're going to revise the plans accordingly. Site plan uh, has also been submitted to Somerset County for their review and approve, approval, and they had sent us some additional comments back in April. So we'll address those. The uh, site plan will uh, also be submitted to the Delaware and Route and Canal Commission uh, for their approval. Uh, as far as regulatory review comments that we received, uh, we received comments uh, from the Township Engineer in a letter dated April 11th, uh, 2022. Um, the applicant, again, uh, will uh, uh, address the comments accordingly and, and work with the uh, township engineer. Uh, we also received comments uh, from the township planner in the letter dated April 11th. Uh, we have received the latest comments from the township environmental commission in the letter dated April 7th, 2022. We've also received the uh, latest comments from the county of Somerset planning board, Somerset County planning board in the letter dated April 26, 2022. We have received uh, the latest comments from the Somerset Union Soil Conservation District in an email dated April 11th, 2022. And again, the applicant plans to work with the township, the county, the Soil Conservation District, uh, and uh, all the uh, consultants and address all the comments. 
I'll stop for a second. Um, what I saw in um, Planner's memo, statement concerning jurisdiction, and I thought uh, Mr. Healy came to the conclusion that we did not have to submit to Delaware Aaron. Does that ring a bell? All right. Hold on one sec. Would not be me. <laughs> that would not be you. Maybe, maybe, I think you may have been, I think I may have opined that it wasn't within a thousand feet of the Dino Canal, so you didn't need the Township Historic Commission review. Maybe we, we, we maybe we expanded that. Yeah, actually, be. just to uh, clear it up, we actually submitted the plans to the Delaware River Canal Commission, and they came back and considered it a major project, so we have to uh, resubmit and based on major project criteria. Yeah, checking my report, that's that's what I said. You do not have to go to our Township Historic Committee. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Remo is open to questions, unless you have more. No, that's, that's uh, fine with my testimony. If you have any questions or if you want me to go through anything in the letters. Uh... Just so to confirm, I, I guess we didn't hear that you can't comply with any of the staff reports. So I guess that means you're going to comply with all staff reports. Is that what that means? Because typically, if there were something that you can't comply with, you would address it to the board. That includes the fire inspector? I, I think the fire inspector's letter had no, no comments, actually. I think there was some comments, but I can't. The report had some extensive comments. And that really, you know, uh, I think what Mr. Healy is saying, we should say either we can or we can't comply with the comments. Yeah, I mean, there were a number of technical comments in the engineer report. Um, my last report, I think you had mostly complied, but I think there may be a few things. Um, so again, typically, you would, if you if you can comply, if your intent is to comply with all the staff reports, um, you would state that to the board, and that'd be a condition of the board's approval. That was yeah. Oh, you can't say yes. Okay, so to clarify, Mr. Emo, let's go through the report and decide what we can, Father. Say yes to the dress or no to the dress. <coughs> so it's clear what we are saying yes to. Um, so let's take a look at CME, the engineering report. And uh, we'd appreciate your help on this, Mr. Healy. It looks to me like the first page is just what we reviewed. The second page, the project overview, we don't have any issues with. Uh, section B, general site improvements, is a description, and also um, also uh, a list of what variances people think or what CME believes may be needed, um, including the interior driveways at 26 feet versus the 24 we're providing, and there was some discussion of angled parking, but I, we're not suggesting that we do angled parking, all right? And the, he just simply points out you need to request a variance. Number nine, he says make sure you request a, buff, a buffer variance. Number 10, maximum building coverage, which Mr. Uh, Remo addressed, that we are asking for it. The maximum impervious coverage, we are requesting that at the 72.2% uh, coverage. Number 12, the engineer indicated a variance might be needed for maximum building height. And uh, Mr. Reno recited the fact that the current plans provide for 39 feet and a decimal point compared to the 35 required. And that might be a, be a question better saved for the architect. All right. Um, number 13 is... Um, is a variance required for parking. We understand that, and we are requesting it. Lot numbers, we're, which is number 14, we don't have any issue with that. Uh, statement, uh, item 15 is a statement that the parish house is to remain. 
And then 16, the applicant should perform the following additional off-site improvements. <coughs> and this is, again, a yes or no. Because the applicant's engineer has noted that all sidewalk uh, along the property frontage will be reconstructed. Therefore, the handicap ramps at the intersection of Franklin Boulevard and Blake Avenue, Blake Avenue and Reeves Street, Reeves Street and Easton Avenue, and Franklin Boulevard and Easton Avenue should be constructed to the latest ADA standards. And this offer defers to the county regarding a review of ADA ramps. We agree with that. We are go we are going to meet the. Hey, Mr. Smith, let me let me just over here. Yeah. Let me just make a suggestion. Right. So. Is it your intent to try? To, is, is it your intent to finish tonight, or, or my understanding there were there were a few outstanding issues. That's, that, our um, staff called today and said they had some issues on the engineering side, and they wanted to talk to Mr. Remo with Mr. Russo, Darren Russo, who is your, mm -hmm. your engineer for CME, um, and we have we talked to Father uh, Simon, and we have no problem with that. Um, which would mean that we would probably get to everybody but the planner tonight. Okay. And we would carry over to your next meeting. The, uh, the reason I ask that, because there were some comments in my report related to variances, like that addressed the calculation of just some mis missing information in the, in the plans, that I can make a final determination on the parking calculation. Right. So that alone, the board can't really decide on a variance if they don't know ultimately what that required. And similarly, I needed more information for the building height. Again, they don't know what ultimately what the, the building height is, so they can't make a decision tonight right. anyway. So I bring that up. Would it be your these suggestion? Comments, let me just finish real quick. Sure. There's four more pages, and these, comments get, and these comments get progressively more technical. Okay. So we're going to be here all night long if you were to go through four pages of highly technical engineering. So what I suggest is if you're going to come back, perhaps in the meantime, go over these comments with your client and the engineer. And if there are any things, any comments in here that they can't comply with, plus you'll have the chance to meet with the engineer, then you can address that to the board. I think that would be more efficient. Yeah, our only concern would be that we do it expeditiously. And I understand that the engineer comes in every Tuesday. To the to the yeah, you're right, and he's, he's so could we set up a meeting for this coming Tuesday with Mr. Yes, Russo absolutely. and staff and get any engineering issues resolved? He, they they are they make themselves available when they when we ask them to be available. So right. and Mr. Remo, are you available on Tuesday? Yeah. And Father, you're available on Tuesday. So we'll lock, put them in a room. We'll lock the door, and only when white smoke comes out will we release them. <laughs> that, if that works for everybody, and then and then hopefully. It's, but, uh, well, it's, I'd love you to be there only because it's your <coughs> parish's money that may be involved in some of the, uh, okay, all right. So the answer is yes. We'll, instead of going into minute and odious detail, we'll uh, have everybody meet with you and uh, Mr. Russo mm -hmm. and Mr. Remo on Tuesday. Okay, sounds and, good. And hammer that out. And then hopefully we get in 90% of our case tonight, maybe saving the planner until next, the August meeting, and hopefully we get to get on and finish after there's been a cosmic agreement between the titanic forces of engineering and planning. Okay. It may make sense to have the architect there as well, because, again, some of the calculations involve changes to his plan, his, his or her plan, so I would need to see. So it may help to have, so we're all on the same page. Mr. Campbell, is Tuesday uh, available for you? What time would you like well, to Typically we meet in the morning. It would be 10, 1030, but it could be early afternoon. <coughs> we can make it as early as 10 o'clock. 10 a.m.? Mark, 10 a.m., and Father, you'll have somebody there at 10 a.m. Okay. I think it would be also wise the next time we meet to, to have the make sure the engineer is here, even though he's <coughs> okay. started his testimony, because yes. if, if oh, yeah. it's Everybody obviously going to change, so there may be questions. We'll have everybody back, hopefully, at the August meeting. and uh, we, can get that, we can get that as we wrap up. Uh, okay. Still, uh, all right, so um, are there any other questions for Mr. Remo? Otherwise, we'll... Do 
you have, do you have, oh, and you do have a planner. Okay. Yes. I don't have any more questions now. Yeah. And we're going to probably hold the planner because, as you said, there may be a slight change in the variances. So our third witness is Mr. Lee Klein, our traffic expert. Okay. One moment. I, I, I will hold any questions from the board or myself until you have the meeting and resolve the issues. And, and we will not, at this time, open to the public for questions until to the engineer until they have a complete report at the next meeting to, to listen to. And Great. And then we can go on to the next witness. And I'd ask that Mr. Lee Klein be sworn so that he can give testimony. Oh, Mr. Klein, do you swear the testimony I'm about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Klein, for the record, by whom are you employed and in what capacity? I'm the principal of Klein Traffic Consulting, 156 Walker Road, West Orange, New Jersey. I'm a professional engineer in the state of New Jersey. My license is current. I'm also a nationally certified professional traffic operations engineer, and that certification is also current. Um, uh, Klein Traffic has been in business since December of 2013, and prior to that, I've worked for other consulting firms. I've been admitted as an expert in traffic and parking at well over 100 planning and zoning we boards. We accept his credentials. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Um, so, as a part of your uh, preparation for tonight's application, did you evaluate any traffic issues and parking issues associated with the site? And if you did, what did you discover? I developed a traffic engineering and parking evaluation report dated March 7th, 2022. And in that report, I studied the uh, current operations of the church, uh, both on Sunday and Saturday, uh, looking at uh, the peak activities at the church with parking. Uh, I also looked at uh, the expansion from 220 seats to 280 seats and did a trip generation calculation for that to determine whether it be a significant increase in traffic. Uh, and then I also uh, opined as to the, the number of seats, number of parking spaces provided, and the adequacy of that parking. So in that report, uh, basically I concluded that uh, we've got uh, proposed 280 seats, and as you heard before from the father, uh, the activities in the congregation room will be alone. There won't be a simultaneous activity in the fellowship room. So the 280 seats is the maximum number of people that will be at the church. And you divide that by three and we get 93 parking spaces required where we're proposing 96. Um, I also looked at the circulation of the site, uh, the driveways, the width of the driveways. We're proposing 24 foot wide drive aisles with 9 by 18 parking spaces. That's an industry standard. Uh, RSIS, uh, the dimensions of parking, uses actually a 23 foot wide two way drive aisle. Your ordinance requires 26 feet, uh, and we were asking for a variance for that two foot difference, and so we're proposing 24, which is adequate for this type of use. Low turnover, people come once to the service, leave. Another group comes and leaves. It's not like a convenience store or a shopping center or even an office building with visitors where people are constantly coming and going and you might want a wider drive aisle. Uh, also, the narrower drive aisle reduces the impervious coverage, which is good for, for drainage and things like that. Uh, so my conclusions were that uh, the parking that we're proposing, the 96 spaces, is adequate to serve the needs of the church, meets the requirement for the, the sanctuary section itself and that there should not be an impact to the neighbors. As a matter of fact, we're going to be taking some driveways away uh, by removing some of the homes. The, I think four homes we're removing. So we'll be picking up some additional space on the street um, that, will, that will be used by the neighbors all the time and could be used for overflow, uh, depending on how the, the side of the street is marked for the festival. Uh, as far as the trip generation goes, the difference between the 280 seats proposed and the existing 220 seats uh, on a Saturday, uh, it's about 28 additional trips. 
and then on a Sunday, it's about 31 additional trips. Uh, the Institute of Transportation Engineers and the New Jersey Department of Transportation say that a significant increase in traffic is greater than 100 peak hour trips. This is 28 and 31. It's less than a significant increase. So we didn't do a full traffic engineering study with traffic counts and traffic analysis because the, the increase in traffic would be insignificant. And yeah, insignificant. So again, my conclusions are that the proposed parking of, 90, of 96 parking spaces is adequate to serve the 280 seats at one per three, uh, and that the um, traffic won't be an impact. The additional traffic for the additional 60 seats will not be an impact to the area, uh, and there should not be an impact to operations of the intersections. Mr. Klein's available for questions. Anything from the board? A quick question I have. Does the church have any agreement with the adjourning, adjourning medical center to use their parking lot on, 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 on Sundays when they're closed for overflow parking? My understanding, and I'm subject to being corrected by anybody, is that the adjacent medical property uh, has never objected to uh, some of our parishioners parking there. But I think the only time that it actually happens is during the festival. Yes. Any other questions? All right, this we will. Well, I, oh. I wanted to just clarify, because uh, uh, the pastor had indicated that there's a serv uh, church service only at 11 a.m. on Sunday, and Mr. Klein's report indicates that there's services at 9 a.m. and 11. I just want to confirm. Yeah, we just what? added that mass during coronavirus time, so we have less people 11. That's all, but now it's canceled. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Of these 96 parking spots, are any of them going to be for EV charging? Curious. I, I, don't, I don't think you have a choice. I think it's state law. Four spaces will have EV charging. So perhaps an obvious question. Um, so you, you evaluated the peak hours of the church, which is on the weekend, and you didn't evaluate the peak hour of the road, which is the morning and afternoon uh, during the weekday. Um, I'm assuming the reason is that church activity is going to be non-existent or minimal? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Sorry. I, I do have one question. You're, um, we're, we're seeking a, a parking variance here, correct? Yes. Um, the EV legislation allows for a two-for-one credit. <coughs> is that considered in your parking calculation? I don't believe it was, actually. No, I think the application was made a good time oh, before right. that yeah, legislation we, came into play. Yeah, we go back a while on this application. So it probably was not considered. We did not get credits, but we'll check that out. I mean, that, that's a Tuesday topic. Because if we get credits for it, maybe we don't need a variance. Thank if you, you no, you'd still need a variance. But you'd, and the reason, so this comes up with houses of worship. Uh, the when a house of worship has a worship area and a fellowship hall, for the purpose of calculating the parking requirements, we include both spaces. Um, but the applicant has testified that they're not going to use both spaces at the same time. Typically, in those situations, the board may decide to make that a condition of the, of the approval. Um, you know, I think the traffic engineer indicated a, a parking um, requirement of 93. And I think what that was based on was the total number of spaces divided by three, and that's the number, of seats, yeah. number of seats divided by three. And that's kind of, kind of your typical standard for a house of worship is one space for every three seats. So basically, that's. Basically, what you're testifying to is based on, you know, again, one space for every three seats is going to be adequate parking. Um, so, again, you may want to, technically, our ordinance requires a lot more because the fellowship hall square footage is included in our calculation. So, you may want to consider having that condition again where they both, they can't be used simultaneously. Okay, any other questions? For, th for this witness, then we will open for the to the public. Uh, if you're out there and you have any questions concerning traffic or parking or circulation, uh, come forward. Give us your name and address. Good evening, Shanique Davis. S H E N I Q. Louder. I mean, higher. 
Shanique Davis, S-H-E-N-I-Q-U-E, Davis, 227 Blake Avenue. Um, I have a question about the traffic study. Uh, it was conducted in August uh, 2020, August 15th and 16th of 2020. During that time, um, our world was different, right? It was during the pandemic, so there might have been less uh, people attending the church services at that period of time. And I think even like a bake sale was part of the study. I'm not sure how many people um, would have attended the bake sale during that period. So I want to know if the traffic study is going to be updated to reflect the current number of people attending church um, in 2022. I think the attendance was similar, the same, so nothing changed. Our parishioners uh, back in June 2020 um, came back to church and we have uh, services every Sunday, so we have the same amount of people if you come today, very similar. Because as I said uh, again, it's our group coming together and that's it. Okay, any other questions for traffic? Hi there, David Zald, that's Z-A-L-D, at 220 Blake Avenue. And I have a question related to the number of parking slots, given that this is part of that parking extends into what is a residential zoning. And the question essentially is, given that there is the possibility of parking at the site across from the church on Reeves, is there actually the need for the full 93 or 96 parking spots, or would that actually be something in considering a variance that would have allowed for a smaller amount of parking slots, allowing therefore for more of a barrier between the parking and the sidewalks and neighborhood side of the street. So I can ask Mr. Klein to respond and then I want to throw a, a, a comment in. The parking standard that we're trying to reach is the 280 because of what Father Simon said, that's going to be the number of people that are going to be there at one time. They'll move to the fellowship hall, so that'll be the number of seats. Divide that by three, we get 93 required. So we're proposing that on site. We can't always rely on off-site parking. Um, if there was a festival or something and we needed to park at St. Peter's next door, we could do that. There'll be some parking on the street during peak times. But for the most part, we're trying to accommodate all the parking that we feel we need on site. So my comment is the board and the applicant have to kind of balance this. One of the concerns we had from the neighborhood is we don't want a new church, new parking lot. We don't want to see additional parking on our streets, on Blake and, and Reeve, et cetera. So you're trying to make sure you have adequate parking on site so that you're discouraging off-site parking or, or on-street parking, if you want to put it that way. And that's kind of the balance. The, re the reason you have that standard is because it's kind of nationally agreed upon it as the right standard for churches. And uh, it's not that, it, listen, it's, it's cheaper for the applicant not to put in the parking, all right? So if you're trying to go small, you would reduce the amount of parking. But you're trying to go big in the sense that you're trying to be respectful of the neighborhood so that you can accommodate the parking on the site. But Mark, we have Mark would you give a brief uh, uh, rundown what buffering requirements might be required uh, between the street and the parking lot and the residential zone part? Well, the, the only um, buffering requirement um, that applies here is um, the 15-foot the um, buffering requirement. That's the conditional use standards for places of worship. Um, typically, those come into play around the perimeter of the property when you have a place of worship adjoining a residence, so you want to have the, the evergreens and, and the fencing. Um, you know, our ordinance doesn't say that it doesn't apply along the street. So, you know, technically they're required to have a 15-foot buffer around the perimeter of their property. Um, but I think Mr. Smith brings up, I think, a, a perfectly um, good and reasonable point, which is I think it is a trade-off. Um, you know, I think they're trying to address concerns that, you know, I'm sure they have heard from the neighbors about having enough parking on their own site so they're not parking within the neighborhood. 
so that part of their application is they purchase these additional properties and are providing a good deal more parking on, on their own site. The trade-off is, in order to do that, they don't have the full 15-foot buffer um, around the perimeter. They have kind of more of a standard parking layout where they have, a, you know, I think it varies from three to five feet, and they have some shrubs kind of around, around the outside to screen the headlights, kind of a standard parking lot. They don't, but they don't have a 15-foot wide buffer with six foot evergreens. Um, I guess they could do that, but if they did that, they're gonna lose a lot of the parking that they're proposing. Again, I think I think Mr. Smith is correct. I think it's a trade-off that the board needs to, you know, should think of. Maybe there's a combination. You know. Okay, just so everyone understands that. Yep. There are no other questions. Again, I guess we'll close to the public as far as this witness goes, and then you can continue. I'd ask that Mike Campbell, our architect, be called and sworn so that he can give testimony. <coughs> Ms. Campbell, if you just raise your right hand, you swear the testimony about to give me the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campbell, let me ask if there's any way you can push the display boards back further and turn them more this way so the people in the audience can, s no, no, go, go in that direction and turn the board so that the board can see them, but hopefully the public can see it as well. Because they are gorgeous. Let's share them with everybody. Can you, can you see it? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. Why don't you move over there and kind of face, per make it parallel to the wall so that everybody can see. We have a helper. We have a volunteers here. Beautiful. Good. All right, Mr. Keith. And I was all comfortable over there. It's okay. <laughs> so listen, if you, if you have a, an A pen, it'd be great if you'd mark these as we go through them. Why don't you mark that A1 and today's date, which is July the 7th. These are all prepared by your office, correct? Correct, yes. Okay. So my question to you is, so what is it going to look like? Uh, we can see. You know, we've, we've done these artist renderings and, uh, of course, replaced the... Really get his qualifications. On oh, I'm sorry, course. sorry, sorry, sorry. Did, and by the way, did we get him sworn in? We did get him sworn yes, in, right? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Campbell, would you give the board the benefit of your credentials? Uh, yes, I'm a licensed architect in New Jersey for like the past 35 years. Also licensed in uh, <coughs> New Hampshire, New York, Pennsylvania, and Florida. And for almost all of that time, well, I've had my own uh, practice since 1989, and my practice is almost exclusively churches, you know, probably 95% okay, of my work. That's fine. Okay. Thank you. So what is it going to look like? Uh, well, uh, I've been involved with this project for seven, eight years. It, it's been a while and a lot of iterations. But uh, uh, in the beginning and, and as we moved along and started working with Father Simon, um, they gave me uh, examples of, of the architecture from, from where most of the members have uh, immigrated from. And so we are matching that, that traditional ethnic <coughs> stone architecture that they're familiar with. So what does A1 show? A1 shows a uh, artist rendering from the uh, parking lot side and the, the side street as you approach. So it shows the entrance to the, the sanctuary, uh, the corner tower, and the, uh, the drive up canopy. Uh, oh, we're where, looking at this from Franklin Boulevard? Correct, yes. Okay. Nice. Okay. Did you mark the next one, A2, if you uh, want to go to A2? Yeah, perhaps I should go to the floor plans to go through a few things and, and answer a few is, questions. Is the tower, the, is it part of the building, right? Uh, yes, it's connected to the building. And, and is that what makes it 39 feet? Uh, no, the thing that gives us the 39 feet, and, uh, and like I said, I've been working on this project a long time, and it was, I think it was actually pre-COVID when we had our workshop meeting here. Uh, so there's been a lot of iterations, and uh, the height variance is, it's really just due to the configuration of the site 
it's an unusual configuration. It, it drops off at that intersection. And then you have a definition of height, and the definition requires you to, to do a calculation. And what do you have to do in that calculation? Uh, so you can, well, you can see from the parking lot side where we're compliant. Uh, I think we're 32 feet here, and I have my reading glasses over there. So <laughs> um, I think we're like 35, we are below 35 feet to the peak of the church proper from the parking lot side. <laughs> We're going to put that guy on retainer. But, uh, so you can see, I will. Uh, so you see we comply from the parking lot side, and we comply with the new fellowship hall uh, on the back elevation. But the, the property uh, drops off at the corner here, uh, right where the, you know, the larger building is, the church proper. And the way the ordinance is, it's, a, it's an averaging of the height across the back here. And that's what puts us over the 35 feet and, and requires a variance. It's just, it's just really for this corner of the site uh, where, the, where the property drops down. So you, conf you basically for 70, 80 percent of the site, you're conforming at the, anything that has the ground level of the parking lot. It's only in the one corner that you get into a jam because of the way in which height is defined in the local ordinance. Right? Yeah, in this, in this, uh, in the Franklin ordinance, yes. And I believe the, the tower, the cupola, is exempt, and you know, that is above 35 feet. Typically in most ordinances, the, the tower or cupola element is, is exempt from that height restriction. And suppose uh, in your meeting with staff on Monday, or Tuesday rather, right? It's Tuesday. Tuesday, yeah. They say, well, can you lower the cross by two feet? Or whatever. Is that something that could be dual if it was required by staff? Uh, it could be done, again, with the, the approval of my client. client of course. Yeah. We would like to have it that high. We think it looks aesthetic, correct? Very pretty? Oh, yes, I, I think anything less. Um, and like I said, you know, over the, the years, and especially the past year or two, uh, there have been a lot of iterations, and, and Father Simon did request several times that I lower the building. So, uh, so it is a lot lower than our original application. And you know, if there was a, a nonconformity of a foot or two, I think we can make that work. Yeah, you know, either by changing the building or changing the grading. To I'm saying just uh, we need to look as a church because lower than that it doesn't look any more like a church. Bef before thing. you start lowering it, let me just put this in perspective, I hope. What I heard, and tell me if I'm wrong, is the part of the facility facing basically the residential areas and most of the part along Franklin Boulevard <laughs> is conforming. In that, height. Is, that is correct, yes. The part that's not conforming in height is the part that faces the corner of Easton Avenue where there are three drivers in a week who are going to be looking at that church to determine how high it is above the ground. They're concerned about not getting hit by somebody going through the stoplight. I hope they're looking ahead. Okay. Not, uh, Thank you. Uh, they believe it to really be a reasonable compromise on the yeah. height but, uh, yeah, Just as several people said, um, if, if you keep lowering it, it's going to start to lose its character, and it's not going to look like a church. It's not going to have the same aesthetic. Uh, you know, a church, you, if you picture this same church with a, with a, a roof <coughs> pitch that's much lower, it's, gonna, it's not going to look aesthetically pleasing. Okay, and is that in the board member's package? That exhibit? I believe so. It's the most recent, so. Okay. So well, it's the most recent working drawing, so. Well, do me a favor and mark it as A2 just in case. Tonight's date. Thank you. And uh, like I say, I'll go to the plans for a few minutes, because. And again, is this in the, the members' packages? I, the same plans, I, I don't think, with all the, the dimensions, because we, 
So yeah. please mark it as A3 yeah. in tonight's date. We had uh, we had put together a, a board package that's not the same as the working drawings. Okay. Um, but uh, kind of going back to a few things uh, Father Simon said earlier about you know why the building's being replaced. Uh, it is a kind of substandard construction, and you know it's it's only 50, 60 years old for the original building. But uh, but if you walk through there, you know the floor is uneven. The construction is laminated wood arches, which are embedded into the masonry, and it's really just a matter of time before the moisture from the masonry completely deteriorates the arches, and you have problems. And uh, same thing for the, uh, the existing fellowship hall. And uh, also, as uh, Father Simon touched on, um, you know, building a building today is not built like building a building 60 years ago. Uh, there are requirements for uh, handicap accessibility, and just, you know, just building the same building by today's standards uh, is going to increase the footprint by you know 20, 30 percent or more just to comply with with what's expected in a building today. And also, I would add that. Uh, Again, like Father Simon said, uh, this is not to uh, increase the intense intensity of the use of the site. It's really just to better serve the people that are already there. It's you know it's a it's a fixed community. It's it's not like an evangelical church where they're reaching out to everybody and and trying to grow their church. It's it's a specific specific religious community they're they're serving, and uh, and they just want to serve them better. Um, so we have the, the new sanctuary. Uh, as other testimony said, uh, 275 seats. Uh, as an architect, I wouldn't use that same standard. I would use 24 inches per person, which would give you 250 people is you know, more comfortable seating. And even at that, um, you know, all the surveys say people think a church is full at like 70%. So it's pretty rare to have a every seat filled, every pew filled in a church. You know, it's more like 70% is, is typical, and that's the size of the, uh, of the congregation. Uh, there was a question about the fellowship hall, and that is, I think we have 4,500 square feet. And uh, actually, the original plan was to keep the fellowship hall, uh, keep the existing, but again, because of concerns of the age of the building and the condition of the building. And also one other concern when they, excuse me, when they calculated the grading of the site and again to, to current standards, um, you know, the, the site couldn't be sloped as steeply as it is now and it had to be sort of more leveled out as it gets to the building. So, so Mark asked me, can, you know, can, we, can we raise the floor in this building over a foot and that's not really practical. And you know, given that and other considerations we already had, uh, the church decided to just rebuild that building. So, so the plans didn't really change. Our architectural plans didn't change. But instead of saying, you know, keep the existing fellowship hall, we're replacing the existing fellowship hall. Uh, and then the, you know, the addition to that fellowship hall is a, a new uh, kitchen that meets, you know, commercial standards for, for, for serving a, a crowd this size. And uh, something else to note about the Fellowship Hall is about like 15, 20 percent of it is uh, dedicated as dance floor. So, uh, so it's never going to be packed. It's kind of like the sanctuary is never going to be packed. The, uh, the Fellowship Hall is not going to be. And also, like I said, I, all I do is work with churches. That's all I've done for 33 years. And uh, and whenever we've made one of these presentations, the, <clears throat> the parking has always been based on the, the sanctuary seating. Not, I've never had an application where the parking was based on the sanctuary seating and the fellowship hall. It was always just the, uh, the sanctuary because they're assumed to be uh, not simultaneous. And again, if, if you'd mark that A4 in tonight's date.
Okay, and this is just the, uh, the lower level. So we, we have a new building that's 21,400 square feet, um, and that's including the, the drive-up canopy because it's under roof, so I figured that should be counted as, uh, as square footage. Um, but we have a footprint of, um, just had it here, of uh, 15,200. And uh, the existing building is all slab on grade. It's one level. Uh, so you know, a large part of the addition to the building is actually below grade. It's not increasing the, uh, the footprint to, to 21,400. And the, the basement level is exactly the same size as the sanctuary level, and that is uh, 6,500 square feet. So that's 6,500 feet that's below grade, 6,500 square feet that's below grade. If you mark that A5, the next one is A5. And uh, this is just the, the, the upper level, which uh, is really just a very small mezzanine. It's, it's not a place for uh, people in the congregation to sit. It's for people in the choir, and it, it's just for when they're up there singing, and then they, they come to the, to the seats downstairs below. And that's also included in that uh, 21,400. And again, the elevations that will you can mark that as A6. Uh, I already marked that as Are two. You already marked it? Yeah. Okay, uh, great. So that'll be part of what we talk about on Tuesday. And uh, back to the original. Back to the front rendering. Uh, we do show the other views. Um, they don't show as much. This would be uh, from the corner where St. Peter's is. This would be the, the, the side of the the fellowship hall in the back of the building. Mark, that is A6. And this is the, the opposite of what I showed you before. Uh, from the side street, uh, looking at the back of the fellowship hall, or the parking lot side of the fellowship hall, and the, uh, the drive-up canopy here. A7. Would that be the view from Reeve Street? Re it, it, yes, yeah, that's Reeve correct. From Reeve yes. Street, okay. Yeah. I'll go back to the back of this board that I put the elevations on. A8. A8. And this is the you know the the elevation that I was talking about earlier, um, down at the main intersection where the the grade slopes down and, and gives us the the issue with the uh, with the height restriction. Terrific. Any other exhibits? Uh, no, that is it. Okay, Mr. Campbell is available to the board for questions. Any board questions? Uh, this isn't exactly is uh, area, but what would the basement be used for? Father or Mike? You said that had the same... I said it's a that is the, uh, the classroom areas. Yeah, and the classes. Father described earlier what those would be used for, the, the Saturday religious yes, classes. Yes, that's Saturday from oh, okay. 1.30 till 4.45. I thought I heard you refer to a basement. I thought, I thought of something different. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, um, what are the materials you're using? Uh, it would be natural stone, uh, natural stone, but it would be, you know, for, for cost and structural re reasons, it would be a, a thin natural stone. And again, they, they have connections to uh, the areas where they immigrated from and sources for a lot of the materials that we'll be using in the building. What about the roof? Uh, yeah, we haven't talked a great deal about that, have we? 
Yeah, we, I'm sorry, we have. Like I said, it's been seven or eight years and a lot of iterations, but we are talking about a, you know, a mission tile type roof, you know, whether that be slate, uh, there are metal alternatives for that. It, it, it wouldn't be like an EFIS or a stamped concrete, it would be... No, no the building would not be, well, EFIS would be the, the exterior facades and it's, it's not going to be that. Okay. Uh, so it'll be uh, a roof with some character, you know, what exact material that is, I don't think we've selected that yet. Any other questions? Yeah, so the overall square footage of the building then is what? Do you have an approximate? Uh, 21,400. Okay. Yeah, I think I discovered the, um, the 35,000 is actually cited in the original application form. And I see kind of how it came off of, I think it's the size of one of the lots, and I think that just got carried through the application. So thanks for clarifying that. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more board questions, we're open to the public. If anyone would like to ask the architect a question concerning his testimony, this is the time to do it. I don't see anyone, so we'll close. And Mr. Chairman, as I understand the process we've all talked about. Tuesday, our engineer, a representative of the church, Mr. Campbell, are going to meet at 10 a.m., and iron out any other engineering questions that there may be or any other questions that there may be. So, that, And then what we'll do is we'll stop now. We have our planner to justify the variances, but just in case the variances change as a result of that meeting, we should save her testimony. Her name is Beth McManus. She is here tonight, but we need to come back and finish the application after we have concurrence with the engineering and planning about what exactly is in front of us. Um, so the question is, what works for you guys in August? We need to set up a date. <clears throat> I have one meeting in August, August 4th. Yeah, uh, the only concern I have about that is that this is uh, July the 7th. And I don't know if staff has any idea of what kind of changes or engineering issues there may be. Is there enough time for Mr. Remo to make any changes? I mean, I, I would suggest we, we move it to August 4th and, and see how it goes on Tuesday. I mean, it, I, okay. I, I can I, I honestly don't know, I can't anticipate what those comments may or may not be. I mean, th those would be from CME. Um, right. And I don't think the nature of my comments, I think it, they could probably be addressed through an exhibit to the board. Now, I don't think you'll have to have revised plans for, to address my comments. So I'd suggest, you know, if it meets your August schedule, 4th. let's do August 4th, see how it goes on Tuesday. If it really doesn't go well, then you can adjourn it. So um, August 4th is a Thursday. I'm hoping to be at MIT, but I have very... Uh, competent staff who can cover for me if I, if I can't make it back from Boston by the night meeting. How is August the 4th for Mr. Remo, Mr. Klein, Mr. Campbell, and Father, of course, is going to be there. All right. And I might be there or, you know, depending if I can get back from Boston. So, um, oh, and Beth. I'm sorry, Beth. And Beth is available. How about, all uh, okay, we'll set it for them, but how about we extend the deadline for action then to September, end of September, just in case then it takes longer. Yeah, just in case. So for the record, we are hereby consenting to an extension to September 1st? Whatever. Well, do it after a meeting, right? For September? We have September 15th, so it should be after September 15th. That's We're hereby, right for the record, extending our requesting uh, or providing an extension of time to the board to September 16th, 2022. So we plan tentatively to hear this again August 4th. Right. Uh, there's no need for further notice or publication, Chairman? No, there's no further notice. And for the general public, at that time, uh, we'll hear probably some additional engineering testimony and testimony from a planner. Public will have a chance to question both, and then the public will have an opportunity to make a statement at the end of all the testimony. That's what will happen, and again, there will be no further notice sent to you in the mail or otherwise. 
August 4th. Thank you, Chairman okay. and members. Next on the agenda, anxiously out there in the hall waiting. Okay, DEVCO, ZBA 210011, use vari de-use variances, preliminary final major site plan, height variance in which the applicant seeks to develop three-story apartment building at 2 Hawthorne Drive, Somerset, Block 194, Lots 127, 128, and the HBD zone. And we'll take a five-minute recess for everybody to move in and out. That's up. Again, and call the meeting back to order if everybody could get in and get a seat, and we'll get started. Uh, 
Testing one. Huh? We'll be all set now. We can get started. This is, again, DEVCO ZBA 210011. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Peter Lanford, Boris Golden, and Foley appearing on behalf of the applicant. Uh, this is an application for a use variance and site plan approval uh, to construct a three-story residential building uh, at the intersection of Hamilton Street and Hawthorne Drive, the street address being 2 Hawthorne Drive. Uh, this site for many years housed an office building which was uh, demolished and we are now trying to construct a building which uh, will require a D variance because we are requesting relief to not put, uh, construct or use the first floor for commercial purposes. Your ordinance for the HBD district uh, requires mixed use buildings with commercial on the first floor and the residential units on the upper floors. Uh, for this building, we are seeking the relief to allow the building to be 100% residential. Uh, we will present testimony in support of the, that variance. Uh, the building itself, as I indicated, would be a three-story building with 15 units, uh, nine uh, one-bedroom apartments and six two-bedroom apartments. Um, the application is pretty straightforward. I do have uh, three witnesses this evening, plus Mr. Dominic, who uh, is the liaison to the Hamilton Street Business District, and I intend to call him to ask him a few questions. Uh, I will start this evening uh, with the testimony of Mr. Testa. Please raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Yes, can you state your full name for the record, please? Your first name is Michael, last name Testa, T-E-S-T-A. Mr. Testa, are you a licensed architect in the state of New Jersey? I'm a licensed architect in good standing in the state of New Jersey. And you've appeared before this board previously, as a matter of fact, uh, presented an application for a building on Hamilton Street previously. Correct. It was 587. We, we accept this credentials. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, before I ask Mr. Testa a few questions, I just want to make a preliminary statement. Uh, we submitted this application well over a year ago. We have had uh, numerous meetings with staff concerning the design of the building. Uh, we recently submitted, I think, either our fourth or fifth rendition of the building. Uh, based on my conversation with Mr. Healy, uh, there are a few other changes he would recommend to the building, uh, although I have not received those recommendations or a report from him. The last report was dated February. Uh, for the record, uh, we understand that we will present the building. If there are modifications that uh, Mr. Healy uh, would like to see, we would be happy to meet with him after the, you know, subsequent to the approval, should the board decide to approve this to to deal with the few tweaks to the building. Um, Mr. Testa, uh, can you, you have with you this evening an exhibit to show the building? Yes, I do. It 
the exhibits I'm going to present to the board are all of the exhibits you have in your board package except for one. We have a 3D color rendering, which I will show last. Sorry, let me... As Mr. Lanford indicated, we have a three-story residential building. Ground floor is uh, 3,937 3, square feet. The second and third floor are both 6,246 square feet. On the ground level, we have Hamilton Street at the bottom of the drawing, Hawthorne Drive on the right side of the drawing. As you can see, the residential units are abutting the Hamilton Street facade. We've modified this floor plan to have a common lower lobby and an upper lobby. The lower lobby, you'll see how it functions from the exterior with the, um, the exterior with the grade. The grade slopes from the high point here on the left side down approximately three feet in the lower corner and then back up the site again. So grading wise, we have some uh, site difficulties that we worked through with the residential units. The back of the property where the parking is, we have parking underneath a portion of the building, with handicapped spots as you can see here, which is the main access into the building. All handicap accessibility goes through the main entrance at this facade, so that's where all our handicap parking is. We have an elevator that's going to take you all three floors. All of the units, all 15, 15 units are handicap accessible. The building will be fully sprinklered. We've also provided a bike rack at the back corner under the building as well for the occupants. The first floor also consists of two one-bedroom units here and here, and a two-bedroom unit on the corner. The second and third floor consists of six units, a mix of uh, one-bedroom and two-bedroom units. We have the corners of the buildings, again you'll see on the facades, as living spaces with large windows, a lot of natural light large bedroom spaces, and again, completely handicap accessible. We have self-contained heating and air conditioning units as well as self-contained laundry, laundry uh, facility inside the uh, building. The roof of the building will have a flat roof with a mansard around the building screening the flat section, and that flat section will be where all the rooftop condensers will be. There will be nothing on the ground. So anything on that roof will be screened by the uh, mansard roof as well as the tower elements. And then as far as the facade, probably I'll work with the rendering here. So we might want to label this one. Can we have that one say one? A one. Today's date okay, sir? Afraid to move the seasonal is going to fall. So as you can see the elevation here, this is the corner of Hawthorne on the right and Hamilton in front of you. You can see in the elevation as the site slopes from a high spot down to a low spot and then back up again. The building facade, we worked with um, staff with a bunch of generations. One of it was trying to integrate a more commercial look into the building. Based on the slope of the site, we really had a difficult time doing that. So what we kind of resolved this lower bottom corner here, which is a low point of the site, creating a storefront element in there, which would be the, one of the lounge areas inside the building. So to give some type of a commercial storefront to the facade that that's at the corner. We have tower elements on each of the corners of the building and an essentially located accented element in the, in the middle of the facade. The facade um, projects in and out, so that way it's not a flat railroad car or box type structure. We have horizontal siding as well as um, sh cedar shake type siding. The siding is used in the pediments up top here, tops of the tower. We use AZAC trim horizontal elements to break the tower up as well as breaking the facade up as well. The trim goes around all of the windows as well as shutters accentuating the um, bump out parts on the facade. And as you can see the lower portion of the building is all cultured stone to give a textured appear a more durable surface um, on the street level. The windows along the storefront, very similar to what we did in 587 Hamilton with the residential units. Um, one of the concerns of the board at the time was the, sa or the safety of the windows with pedestrians walking by. One of the, the solution that was um, approved at that meeting was to provide safety glass on those windows, a laminated safety glass. So a laminated safety glass is um, 
it's two sheets of glass with a piece of plastic film in between it, so it's very difficult to break through and get in. The building has two means of egress. The windows are not required for egress, um, but are as large as egress windows, if not larger, uh, to create more light and air throughout the entire spaces. The um, building materials and facade is consistent around all four sides. Again, we have the mansard roof. You can see in the two lower sections, these tower elements here, and that conceals the equipment that would be on the roof. The height area, the height uh, requirement in the area is 40 feet. Since the site slopes, we took a mean height. This is the highest point here, which is about 43 feet, uh, three inches. According to the business district uh, ordinance, a building is a corner building and it allows for higher um, building heights. The building again that we did on 587 was a corner street as well, where we use similar tower elements to achieve the um, accentuation of the corners and to give it a more prominent appearance. So the highest point here is 43. These are about uh, 42 at the, at the towers. And that's pretty much designed, again, to accentuate the different parts of the building and to conceal the rooftop equipment. <coughs> and that pretty much concludes my testimony. A couple of quick questions, Mr. Testa. Uh, this building is basically at the entrance to the Hamilton Street Business District as you're exiting the city of New Brunswick, correct? Correct. And at the present time, are there any commercial uses around the subject property? Other than the building that was there, that was, was torn down, not that, I'm, not that I've seen and I'm aware of. I, there's residential properties facing this building here. There's residential properties on Hawthorne, uh, single family style homes. So that's why the design of the building, we tried to keep in context with the adjacent properties. I, I can't see the single family homes or rows of disappearing. We try not to go with a contemporary, again, discussions with the board, guidance and trying to resolve the overall appearance as being part of the gateway into this area it was very sensitive and we worked very hard with them to try to achieve a, a successful facade. Okay, and then also just for the benefit of the board, when you started this project initially, did you in fact look at putting commercial on the first floor and what were the problems associated with that? Well, the first floor, if we had a flat surface like most uh, retail buildings would have, it's easy to walk in and out of storefronts. Again, there's a, approximately a three foot drop from one corner to the other. I've done retail buildings where you have sloping sites where we've stepped the floors. Those are typically a much larger building. So we're able to have larger tenant spaces, easier to rent. If we had to put doors probably would only have two or three tenant spaces along here, you'd wind up with four and five hundred square foot tenant spaces. It would become difficult to rent and it would also have an odd appearance, very choppy along the base of the building. Now, the, the, the rendering that the board is looking at shows the building in basically beige tones uh, and browns, is that correct? We have a, a brown mixture of stone on the bottom. The tower and center elements are actually a white color and the interior color is a, a taupe or beige color, all earth tones. Okay, and those colors are going to be the colors that the building will be constructed in. It, we're not going to make it a blue building, a purple building, or anything like that. Those are the actual colors that the client intends to construct. No, and that's the intent. And, see, and this is a design tool even for us, not just to show the board members to get a real feel. After looking at the first go of this, we modified the colors and resent it back to the owner for approval because we get to see it come to life as well, and we see things that we can improve upon. There's, in, the, in the renders, you can see the windows towards the higher end of the site, they kept them all the same window heights, but in this area here, the window sills do get too close to the sidewalk. After seeing it now three-dimensionally, that's something we would address where we'd bring those window sills up at least a foot above grade. Again, they don't need to be egress, but we'd like them to have them as large as possible. I think that would be an appropriate solution to that condition. Okay, th thank you. I have no further questions. Anything from the board? Uh, well, I see a need to open to the public. There is a member of the public I'm here. I'm sorry. I guess we do have one. Questions for the I architect. Wait, wait, uh, My eyes are failing. It's getting late. Bob Hanway. I'm uh, adjacent uh, in the adjacent building to, to this one here on Hawthorne Drive. 
I, I got this notice uh, approximately a month ago for the uh, June 2nd board meeting, but I'm, I'm glad that it was postponed to today because I couldn't make it last time. I just had a couple of minor questions. On this project notice, it indicates that a new two-way driveway opposite to the existing break in the middle, which is the grassy island, uh, but it's not, it's not opposite to the existing uh, break in the middle. It's moved further up towards uh, Hamilton Street. So, uh, Mr. Heinrich, let me over here. Yes. So there's going to be additional testimony from an engineer and maybe another. Just right now, the chairman and the board are looking for any questions you have of the architect and the testimony he just gave at this point. Not, not as far as architecture is concerned. Okay, so if you have additional questions, okay. again, there's going to be somebody else. I think that question is going to be more for the site engineer. Thank you so much. Yep. Thank you. And we'll close to the public. And next, Mr. Sadowski. Just raise your right hand. Do you swear the testimony about to give be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. State your full name for the record, please. Ronald J. Sadowski, S A D O W S K I. Licensed engineer in the state of New Jersey? Yes. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Sadowski has also testified before yes. this board, so will you accept him? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sadowski, you prepared the site plan, which is the subject of this application? Yes, I did. Uh, and can you? Briefly describe the subject property uh, as it is today and also the surrounding land uses to the subject property. Uh, yes, currently. Uh, submitted. To uh, this is actually just a color site version plan. of the landscaping plan, which is in the site plan package. Would okay. you like me to? Yeah, mark it A2. A2? If, you, if the easel doesn't fall over, probably be fine. It, no, I was going to say, can you move it a little bit closer so that the people at this end of the uh, ward and can, can see it a little bit better? Thank you. And if it collapses, I'll take the blame. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, currently there is a two-story office building along the westerly portion of the property with an access uh, onto Hawthorne, uh, which we are demolishing as part of this application. The surrounding uses are residential, uh, single-family, um, multi-family apartment uh, buildings as well. Um, the, we are in the Hamilton Business District along Hamilton Street, but predominantly in the uh, perimeter is the R7 zone, residential zone. Okay. And can you describe to the board very briefly the site plan? How are we getting onto the site? Uh, where's the parking? Uh, and, and review that with the board. Yes, we are utilizing the existing curb cut that's on Hawthorne. Hawthorne is actually a divided uh, road one way in each direction. Uh, we will be sliding the, ex the existing um, cut in that island to help facilitate the alignment of a, the parking on our site. There will be a two-way entrance off of Hawthorne onto the property along with 25 uh, parking spaces, two of which will be van accessible ADA and four electric vehicle spaces. A portion of the parking will be located underneath the second and third floors of the apartment building. The apartment building will be located um, directly on the property line of Hamilton Street and off of Hawthorne because of the radius in the property line. All of the parking, again, is in the back of the lot. We have landscaping along the perimeter of the parking lot to uh, help assist in uh, light trespass from uh, vehicles parking in the lot. We have a dumpster for trash and recycling collection. 
Uh, we have a bike rack, uh, which is underneath the, uh, the overhang of the building, um, which will stay dry. And then also along Hamilton and Hawthorne, we've implemented the Hamilton streetscape, which includes uh, decorative trees, decorative uh, lighting, um, a um, trash and um, recycling receptacles, and also a bench. Uh, we've also included some on-street, there's four, I'm sorry, three on-street parking spaces on Hawthorne Drive. Okay, is there a fence being proposed as part of this project? Yes, there is, along the, I want to say the northern property line adjacent to the uh, existing property, yes. Okay, so there will be a fence on one side or more than one side? So there's an existing fence now um, okay. on, the, on the west side. Okay, and if that fence is, because it's an old fence that needs to be repaired or upgraded, that will be repaired or upgraded? Yes, it will. Okay, and then there will be a new fence to the rear of the property as you're looking to the property from Hamilton Street? That's correct. We'll make the fence all uniform. That's correct. Okay. Now, you, you mentioned something about the, the, the break in the curb on Hawthorne Drive and aligning it with the... Uh, curb cut. Can you ex explain that? Yes, currently the location of that curb cut, if you were to pull into the site, uh, we would hit these parking spaces here to the north. So what we were proposing is to slide that curb cut on Hawthorne down, I went down meaning to the south, about 10 feet. It was brought to my attention that um, people use that curb cut uh, or that island uh, to make a U-turn, being that U-turns are not permitted on Hamilton. So uh, what we were uh, proposing to do is to keep the northern uh, portion of the existing curb cut and just on the southern side where we needed to align with our, uh, our new access, we would then uh, create the new the new southern portion of the curb cut. So instead of a 24 foot wide aisle and maybe 34 feet of a curb cut to allow for people to make U-turns because I've been told when buses try to navigate that U-turn, they run over the island. So to help assist with that, we would extend that opening by another 10 feet, which would help the vehicles making the U-turns and would then also facilitate uh, vehicles entering the new property the new development. Would we be doing anything to the island itself? Uh, other than um, repairing some of the curb that's been beaten up, no, nothing else. Okay, so the, the location of the island does not change? No, not at all. Okay, now you, you mentioned the uh, dumpster. Is the dumpster going to be enclosed? Uh, yes, be an it will be enclosed, uh, CMU block, which will, with the finishes, that will match the, uh, the building, and there will also be a uh, solid uh, gate in the front of it, yes. Okay. Is there any lighting being proposed uh, to handle the uh, parking lot and illuminate the parking lot? Yes, there are. There are uh, pole-mounted lights that are proposed along the perimeter uh, as part of the design and part of the condition of approval. We will make certain that the, the lighting intensities uh, meet the uh, ordinance, the light ordinance, and also that there are no, there is no light trespass onto the adjacent properties. Okay. Is there any stormwater management required with this project? Yeah, we, yes, we are increasing the um, overall runoff on the property. And what we have done is we've implemented an underground stormwater uh, system using uh, percolation slash recharge to uh, handle the additional runoff. Now, or can you review the, the zone requirements or are there any, any variances that are being generated as a result of this application or do we meet the bulk requirements of the ordinance? Uh, we meet all the bulk requirements. The one issue p potentially is the uh, height of the building being uh, the maximum permitted at 40 feet. We're at 43.25 feet, but again, we are a corner lot, uh, which we are allowed to therefore uh, exceed. But with respect to all, to all of the other uh, 
parts of the, the front yard, rear yard, side yard setbacks, impervious coverage, we are in compliance with the ordinance. 100% in compliance. Okay. Is there an issue with respect to the number of parking spaces? Uh, being that we have electric vehicle <laughs> spaces on the property, we are allowed to reduce the uh, required parking by 10%. So for this uh, development, without electric vehicle spaces, we would need 28 spaces. The 10% reduction gets us to 25.2. We have 25 parking spaces on the property. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have no further questions. Anything from the board? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I forgot. Uh, there was a staff report generated uh, in conjunction with this application back in February of this year. Uh, by the Township Consulting Engineer, CME. Have you had an opportunity to review that report? I have. And in the report, there are some requested modifications to the plan. Uh, can you make all of those modifications yes. to the plan and do they in any way substantially alter the plan? They will not. Okay. Um, there was also a report from Mr. Healy dated February 9th, uh, of this year. Have you reviewed that report? I, yes, I have. And to the extent that the report addresses engineering issues, uh, can you make all the changes uh, requested by Mr. Healy? Well, the one issue that I did want to bring up at the meeting uh, is the Hamilton Business District and the streetscape requirements. We show planter boxes, three of them, along Hamilton Street, but because of the amount of underground uh, gas lines that are in the area, we felt that it would not be wise to install trees in that area. So we have the, the uh, soldier pavers in those areas that would represent where those three trees would be. Um, Mr. Healy has asked if perhaps we could come up with another plan uh, where we would put those trees and what we had discussed amongst uh, the client and the professionals is perhaps putting planter boxes uh, which would just sit on top of concrete pads uh, in, to, in lieu of the three trees. Okay. And just for the record, what is the problem with putting trees in? The um, gas lines that are underneath the side, the existing sidewalk in Hamilton Street are concerned are the root systems of the trees and the impact they may have on the gas lines. Thank you. Do you, do you know if that gas line, um, does this only affect this property, do you know? Does it then go into the middle of the street? Um, that I do not know. Okay. Do you happen to know how deep the gas line is? No. Okay. I mean, obviously, we're not going to have them plant trees if it's a safety hazard. So what I would suggest is why don't we have a conversation with, the en with, with our engineer. Okay. Maybe some of those questions should be asked um, and discussed. And obviously, if it, there's an issue where, I mean, if it's not very deep, um, then obviously some other solution will have to be looked at. So, and planter boxes may be the appropriate solution. Very good. Um, so if the board is um, agreeable, if, if, if the board uh, ultimately decides to approve it, I think that could be something that could be a condition to work out with staff. Sounds good. Okay. I have no further questions of Mr. Sadowski. Okay, now, any from, anything from the board? I could, Mr. Chairman, just a few questions. Um, and just to clarify, you had said that since it's a corner lot, the the building height's 40. And I think you said since it's a corner, we're, we're 43 point something, but since it's a corner lot, that it doesn't apply or something like that. Mm, no. uh, but I just want to clarify that it does apply, but I think your justification for the variance is that there's an architectural feature at the corner and maybe your, maybe your planner's going to speak to that. But it's not that if you're at a corner, the, 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 the 40 foot doesn't apply. Understood. OK. I just wanted I to. I misspoke. I'm sorry. I, I just want to make sure it was clear well, for, for, the, yeah. for the record. If you want to call it, I, I looked at that. It, doesn't, it, it, it allows you to go above 40 feet if you have a building at the corner, if there are features at the corner. It doesn't say you need a variance. It says you can go above 40 feet. 
If you want to call it a variance, we can call it a variance. But if you look at the Hamilton Street Business District ordinance, it says you can go above 40 feet at a corner building. Okay. I, I have. I, in the meantime, I'll look up. I'll look at the ordinance. I haven't looked at this in in, in a while. But yeah. with with the, with the approval of the board. But it doesn't say it's a okay. variance. Okay. I got gotcha. you. It says you can. Okay, that's not okay. I got it. I, so I think my I think my my point still stands. I mean, I think the ordinance doesn't say you can go up to 44 feet if you're at a corner, but it says I think it encourages certain architectural features at the corner, and it says well you might go above. Yeah. So I think you still need the relief from the board. And again, I think your testimony is the architecture. You've incorporated these corner features into the architecture of the building, and I'm sure Mr. Bryan's going to opine about. The consistency of that with the design standards of the Hamilton Street zone, and I'm sure he's going to have some testimony that justifies the variance to the board. So we'll hear we that go. when he comes up. <laughs> um, I do actually, if you don't mind, I do have a question of the architect, um, and that is, do you have any um, plan for incorporating, are you going to have any signage for the building? Uh, we're not anticipating signage since there aren't uh, retail spaces or maybe a sign for the name of the building. I don't have anything in the plans for that other than just a street number on the building. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, so our design standards to talk about that as well. So I guess at the appropriate time when you come up with a plan, we'll have to take a look at that. Yeah, we definitely will work with you as to location. If you wanted to have gooseneck lighting on it to be consistent with the style of architecture or internally illuminated. We would work with you, Mark, on that okay. uh, aspect of it. I'd also like to take this moment to clarify something. Peter had indicated nine two bedrooms and one, I'm sorry, nine one bedrooms and six two bedrooms. When we revised the first floor plan in order to create that additional um, communal space, we wound up losing or converting a two bedroom into a one bedroom. So just for record purposes, we have 10 one bedroom units and five two bedroom units. I just want to put that on the record, okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, we'll open to the public. Would you like to ask him any questions? Hi, Chairman. All right, so I already spoken with this gentleman about that uh, cutting the center, uh, center island. You know, school buses turn there every day and they ha don't have enough space. Uh, so they go over the grass. So by allowing to uh, keep the uh, cut in the, in the center aisle over there and extend it for your needs, then uh, this problem will be solved. We, we, we don't have to reseed the grass every year. Uh, now, there was a sign over there uh, that got knocked out and it disappeared. It was a no, no parking here to corner which started on my property, and they meant the corner of Hawthorne and Hamilton. Now, from what I understand, they, they, they have requested on-street parking over there. We are showing it if there is a township ordinance or if the police decide to post it for no parking, then there won't be any parking. Well, there was a, no, there was a sign for no parking over there. They got knocked out and it disappeared after a while. Okay. So, so I don't know if that may, um, in, in order for the township to put up a no parking sign anywhere, they have to adopt an ordinance. So we will look, if there's an ordinance in yes, place, please. then it will well, continue to be no parking. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, now, now uh, you also propose modification to the curbs. Now, is that the street curbs or the median? Well, there's going to be curb replacement along Hamilton and Hawthorne along the property frontages and where there's damage or in need of repair as part of the reconstruction of the access for Hawthorne, we will replace the curb there, yes, and okay. patch the pavement. Okay, you also showed me on the, on the, uh, on the photo over there that you are planning to grade, you, uh, towards, uh, you, you plan to grade upwards towards Hawthorne Drive? We're going to maintain the grading as it exists today. There is there's, a there's no grade. No, the grading is not grade, so there's always a uh, surface runoff. Well, we've we've regraded the, the the parking lot to conform with township standards, so that there is no 
ponding on the site. There's always positive drainage. We have that to our underground system, yes. Because yeah. you, looked at, you looked at the curve that we had on drive. But again, it's not existent. It's the, the curve is flush the, or the, the, the curb will all be replaced and have a minimum four yeah. inch reveal okay. along the county road, okay. yes. But presently, there's also an evergreen screen between my property and the proposed property. Yeah. Those are mature trees. Uh, nowhere does it say that you're going to take those out and replace them, but you know, whatever your needs are. And you're also going to erect a vinyl fence. There will be a vinyl Is fence. Is that necessary? Yes, along the northern property line, we are proposing a vinyl fence, solid vinyl fence, along with some plantings. These plantings are the ones that you say exist. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if they exist, we will just. Uh, add to the uh, the existing row of plantings where they may be bare. We, what we're looking to do is to have more of a solid uh, row of plantings along with the fence as uh, on the north side and then also on the west side of the property. Yeah, the fencing on that on that on the other side is, is completely broken. Right. So uh, I don't know whose fence that is. Well, we'll we will replace with a, a, a solid vinyl fence to match the balance. Oh, so are you saying you don't want a fence? I'm a little confused. No, no, they're, they're both co commercial, commercial properties. Uh, I, you know, if we don't need a vinyl fence, I, I prefer not to have a vinyl fence on my side, but they can definitely put a vinyl fence in the back because the, the fence is broken over there, you know, just for aesthetical purposes and, and probably safety also. So again, just to be clear, what they're proposing on their site, on their site, not yours, is a six foot high vinyl fence on their site and a row of evergreen trees. So you're saying you, you raise well, already a row of evergreen trees over there. And of course, they have to be, I trimmed it on my side because it came over on my side. I trimmed it on my side. It's not trimmed on their side. So if they can trim it and save those trees because they're, they're, they're evergreen and they absorb light and, and sound, so it should not be a problem if, if but, that can, it So can, I think Mr. Yeah. Sadowski said that he can look into whether that yeah. those can stay. I think it might depend on the grading and where the new curb's going in That's right. and where those trees are. Absolutely. So I think if I can, <laughs> Mr. Sadowski, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you know, you'd say you'll look into whether those can be saved. If they can't, though, then the screening's going to be the six foot high Final fence and this and the row That's of evergreen new, new evergreen trees that place will come down. Fine. They can look into whether any of those trees can be, can be salvaged. Yes. Mm -hmm. So so again, my biggest concern was the U-turn that uh, trucks make. You know, if if you can leave the existing car in the road and extend the, in, and extend it into theirs, that that would be a win-win situation for everybody. Yeah, I think you bring up a good point uh, as far as that parking. I, I think the, the reason why the applicant is proposing um, parking there is just the overall goal. Whenever we have an application on Hamilton Street, is to we try to maximize not only the parking on site, but also try to maximize the on street parking. But I think in this situation, we have you know a scenario where where buses are using that to turn around. And if there's and if there's an existing no parking restriction, then those additional on street spaces, um, you know, may not may have to go, uh, not just because of the restriction, but if also if those spaces are going to impede those that those you know movements, See, they may is, have to go. This is what happens. So I think it's a good point, and uh, they'll, they'll have to look into that. We'll, we'll yes. look into that with the applicant and staff. Thank you so much. Okay, that is what this, Mr. Dominic. Raise your right hand. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. You swear the testimony about to give away the truth, the whole truth. I do. The truth. Mr. Dominic, what is your occupation? I am currently the township's economic development director, and for the purposes of tonight's hearing, I am also the executive director of the Hamilton Street Business District. Okay, and as the executive <laughs> director, uh, does the Hamilton Street Business District review plans that before they come to the board? Yes, they review every plan that is in the HB di district and offers uh, their opinions and their <clears throat> their feelings, typically uh, through uh, Mark's reports to make it easier so they don't have a separate report. And 
in this instance, when we submitted the plans to the Hamilton Street Business District, uh, as indicated both by Mr. Tessa and myself, uh, there were various iterations of the plan and changes and improvements to the plan, were there not? Yes, and, and, and to, to, to clarify, all of the architectural comments were from the Hamilton Street Board. Uh, they go through Mark as the conduit because it's just easier because he typically deals with all the planning. So we use Mark's report, but all the comments were from uh, the HDB board. There are some additional minor comments that, that you mentioned that we will get to you that we will work with you to, uh, to, in, to incorporate. Okay, and also in reviewing the plan, uh, the board saw that uh, there was no commercial being proposed in conjunction with this application. Uh, did the board have an opinion with respect to that aspect of the application? The board unanimously and uh, adamantly supported having only residential. Uh, as most of you ride up and down the street, there are thousands of square feet of vacant uh, retail commercial on the street, and to add additional space, especially in a relatively small building at the end of the street, the, the Hamilton Street Board felt would be inappropriate. Thank you. I have no further questions. Any board questions? Well, I'll ask a question that I know the answer to since I was in the meeting, um, but it may help the board. And so, you know, I was in the meetings with the Hamilton Street um, um, Zoning Subcommittee with Vince. The um, proposal to have the kind of the commercial looking aspect at the corner, um, that came from some suggestions from the Hamilton Street group? Yes, that, that was a very important component that we appreciate them in incorporating because it gives the same feel of it being commercial, <coughs> but at the same time, we don't have empty store space. Okay. Well, that's it for me, yes, sorry. Okay. <laughs> open to the public. Would you like to ask Mr. Dominic any questions? Okay, we'll close and go to the planner. Mr. O'Brien. Thank you, Mr. Dominic. <coughs> you swear the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Mr. Chairman, Mr. O'Brien is a licensed professional planner who has testified before this board on a regular basis. I would offer his testimony this evening as a professional planner and ask the board That's accept it. That's fine. Yeah. Mr. O'Brien, you are familiar with A, the zoning ordinance of the Township of Franklin? I am. The master plan of the Township of Franklin? I am. And the Hamilton Street Business District ordinance? Also, I am. Okay. Uh, if we can, since it's sort of getting on in the evening, can you briefly take the board through what your analysis was, uh, why we're here, and the conclusion that you have reached with respect to this application? Certainly. And I am acutely aware, Chairman, that I'm the only thing standing between you and that door right now. So uh, <laughs> I believe that I can go to uh, conclusory statements on this uh, with some uh, factual backup. And I'll be more than happy to uh, enlarge my testimony upon uh, any questions of the board or of staff. As the board knows, any application for a use variance, a D1 variance, has got to show you that there are unique properties uh, that would allow that variance to be granted. And in this particular case, the unique properties involve the uh, Hamilton Street District Plan, which was adopted in 2015. There are a number of goals to that plan. Uh, such as a pedestrian-friendly environment, uh, one that incorporates walking, shopping, living, encouraging students, young people to live in this particular area, and trying to create buildings that accomplish those things. Over the years, this board has uh, approved a number of buildings along Hamilton, along Hamilton that you've seen. Uh, a few of them you've approved. I've worked with Mr. Lanford on that did not have commercial because it was felt the commercial was not appropriate in those locations due to the existing commercial. So in terms of unique, 
uh, what's unique to this project is meeting and conforming to the requirements of the Hamilton Street Business District and providing that walkability and livability without providing the commercial aspect because the commercial aspect has already been provided in the existing retail restaurants and other commercial areas. <coughs> Excuse me. We're all aware of what COVID did to our economy starting two and a half years ago, uh, which killed a lot of retail, a lot of restaurants, and the ones that, is, that, have, that have survived uh, is retail that is absolutely necessary for our daily living, places we have to go to to get stuff, or places that are destinations where we want to go and get a particular good or a particular service. So that's what exists along Hamilton Street now, and it doesn't make any sense for this application to put an empty space there, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to join the other vacant spaces that Mr. Dominic has just attested to. The proposed building is right size for this lot. No variances are requested um, in terms of parking or bulk standards. The application meets the land use law because it does meet goals A, to encourage municipal action to guide the appropriate use or development of all lands in the state in a manner which will promote the public health, safety, morals, and general welfare. Item B, secure safety from fire and other disasters. G, provide sufficient space in appropriate locations for a variety of uses. L, to promote a desirable visual environment. And M, to encourage coordination of the various public and private procedures to the more efficient use of the land. And that meets, this application meets those goals of the municipal land use law by providing much needed current housing that is code compliant to current code, so it will be very, very safe to capitalize on its proximity to New Brunswick and will attract students and young professionals. It meets the goals of the master plan, not only in the Hamilton Street Business District, uh, where it does say revitalize the Hamilton Street corridor by encouraging appropriate private investment and redevelopment in, an, in the area that is consistent with the township's vision for the area as an attractive, pedestrian-friendly Main Street area. And also the master plan goal of maintain the diversity of housing, but encourage infill and stabilization of current residential areas rather than continuing sprawl patterns of development. This application also meets the negative criteria which you're aware was one of the prongs needed for a D1 variance. Uh, providing much needed housing here, I do not see as a negative for the township, uh, but rather as a positive, a new tax rateable. Uh, construction will utilize area supply houses. Workers will frequent area businesses. And the residents will add to the economic vitality of Hamilton Street. <clears throat> so in terms of conclusion, uh, we've met the uniqueness, we've met the special reasons for the municipal land use law, the positive criteria by discussing the uh, municipal master plan, we've met the negative criteria, and lastly I would conclude that I believe this application can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and without substantial impairment to the zone plan and the zoning ordinance. Welcome, any questions? I just have one question as referenced by Mr. Healy, the issue of the corner, the building at a corner and the height and whether a variance is or may or may not be needed. And if it is, do you have an opinion as to the grant of the variance? The Hamilton Street Business District uh, regulations do say that the board can consider uh, options when it comes to corner properties and corner buildings and taking into account the various fenestrations that are given, uh, they can grant exceptions to the height requirement of 40 feet. Whether that's a waiver, whether that's an ordinance, I would leave that to the zoning officer or Mr. Healy. But whatever it is, I believe that you've seen the plan in front of you, the rendering of the building, and I think that's a very attractive building, and I think that answers the question as to whether or not the board can grant that height exception whatever it may be, a variance or waiver or whatever. And I think that's within the board's power. Thank you. I have no further questions of Mr. O'Brien. Anything from the board? What, what is the building height again? 40, 40, 43, 43, 43. 
Yes, so that by 3-3. Three, three. So the language is, such building may be designed to have additional height and architectural embellishments relating to the location on a corner lot if deemed appropriate by the board. So, you know, the height requirement is 40 feet, right, period. So anything above 40 is a variance, period. It doesn't say you can go up to 44 feet. So it is a variance. But again, as I said before, and you just testified, there is language that says that you're supposed to have these architectural treatments at the corner, and the board, if they're satisfied with the testimony and the and the architecturals that have been presented by the board, I mean to the board, you might may find it appropriate to grant that. And if so, I think it would fall under the C2. You know, it's not a hardship. It, it is a C2. You know, it could deem it be a C2 variance because it's furthering the purpose of zoning and furthering the design standards of this zone to meet certain design standards. But, but it said, is a variance. <laughs> what he said and the benefits outweigh the detriments of the C2. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Open to the public. Anyone have a question or a statement? Okay, then we'll close. You want to say anything, Mr. Lamfrey? Very, very briefly, um, as I stated at the beginning of, of this application, uh, although this is a, a very small site, uh, it is a very important site in that it is really the start of the Hamilton Street Business District. We have spent uh, a great deal of time with staff uh, trying to create a building which is the gateway into Hamilton Street. Uh, I think we've achieved that as best as we can, subject to some additional tweaks that may be worked out between Mr. Testa and Mr. Healy. Uh, with respect to the height variance, uh, I think as indicated both by Mr. Healy and Mr. O'Brien, it is supportable because it does give the building character at that corner. Uh, we do meet all of the other requirements of the zone, and I would re respectfully request that the board grant the D variance to waive the uh, commercial requirements on the first floor, grant the site plan approval, and grant the height variance. Thank you. Anything from the board? Mr. Chairman, let me just outline a few things just because of, there were a few changes made at the hearing. Um, so it was clarified that it's now 10 bedroom, uh, 10 one bedroom and five two bedroom building heights 43.3. Uh, I think some of the uh, conditions, potential conditions that have been discussed, obviously compliance with all staff reports. Um, they're going to work with the uh, HPD zoning committee on some additional architectural uh, uh, adjustments, uh, minor tweaks to the architectural treatment. Um, the uh, issue of that island was brought up. I don't believe the plans show the existing trees, so I think we're going to have to, you know, look to see, you know, if they need. Yeah. Are they all staying? Yeah. Okay. So what we've heard is that all of the all of the trees that are in that island are staying. Okay. Um, and then we have to look at the the parking on on um, Hawthorne and whether those existing spaces uh, or the proposed spaces can stay or not based on the conversation that was had. So those are the, con the conditions that I, I have in my notes. I would put those all in the form of a motion and add uh, the discussion on whether the trees need to be planted in pots. Yes, that issue as well as the issue, um, the screening um, adjoining um, Dr. Heinrich's property, you know, with the uh, um, preference to keep the tree, the existing trees, if possible. If not, it'll be as proposed, uh, a combination of, of fencing and proposed trees. I move to approve the application with those conditions that we talked about. Any discussion? Okay. Mr. Procano? Yes. Bill Reese? Yes. Gary Rosenthal? Yes. Asim Vadas? Yes. Faraz Khan? Yes. And Chairman Thomas? Yes. I think it's good to get some customers for the uh, other retail that's there. 
Good luck with it. And is there a motion to adjourn? Still no. a second. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Everyone have a good weekend.